All right, everybody, welcome back to Introduction to U.S. Multicultural Literatures. Today we are going to conclude our discussion of Louise Erdrich's novel Antelope Woman, um, which is our exemplary novel of the multicultural era and of magical realism in fiction. And it is a novel that exists kind of in two time frames because the first version of it was published in the late 90s, but then a revision was published in 2016. So it's sort of a late 20th century and a 21st century novel at once. Uh, what I'd like to do in today's lecture, so in the last lecture we simply uh, mostly discussed the plot and we only began to look at some passages of the novel to discuss its themes. What I would like to do in today's lecture is to simply finish the discussion of the plot. The second half of the book is considerably less complicated, I think, because uh, all of the setup has been done and the setup is what was really complicated who these families were and what their interrelations were that was the complicated part in the first half of the novel the second half of the novel is more of just a working out of those relationships that were set up in the beginning so i want to finish with a summary of the second half's plot and then i want to spend most of this lecture looking at some passages for evidence of the novel's themes, what it is it's trying to say to us about these issues that it raises, and how, what kind of a style in which it is doing this. So that will be today's lecture. I'm just going to get started. We left off with chapter nine. So the novel is divided into four parts, though it has continuous chapter numbering. So we left off with chapter nine. So I want to pick right up. We were still in part two, Nij, and the names of each of the parts are Ojibwe words for numbers. So it's part one, and then the Ojibwe word for one, part two, the Ojibwe word for two. Um, so Erdrick is, it's a very multilingual novel. There's a lot of Ojibwe words and concepts in it, as well as some also some uh, European languages, particularly German, throughout the work. So chapter 10, The Gravitron. This is a fairly short and simple chapter. In this one, Frank and Rosen, you'll remember that Rosen was married to Richard Whiteheart Beads, but their marriage began to fail, and she began having an affair with Frank, who was a descendant of Shawano. And Frank and Rosen take Callie and Deanna, the Rosen's twins with Richard Whiteheart Beads, to the state fair. And at the state fair, they ride this ride called the Gravitron. And the ride goes out of control because it appears that the operator has is on drugs or something. And so they are sort of spun wildly in this harrowing way in the ride. And when they get off, Rosen is comforting Frank in a way that suggests to the children, uh, to Callie and Deanna, that there's this real connection, this real love between them. So that is that chapter. Then in chapter 11, Yellow Pickup Truck, we rejoin the story of Rosen and Richard's marriage. So they sort of say their farewells to each other. They have this tense conversation. Richard knows that she's in love with Frank. Richard, meanwhile, has to flee because he is under investigation for illegal dumping along with Klaus. So he and Klaus are going to run away from the authorities by kind of going undercover and posing as essentially street uh, people, as people, you know, without a home who live on the street who aren't going to be recognized as their former identities. And in this chapter, we get a little bit of background into the early days of Rosen and Richard's marriage. They met within the American Indian movement. So the American Indian movement, which was actually founded here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, was one of those late 1960s social protest movements. And in many ways, I think we could see it as being parallel to the black power movement that we already discussed. It was not as much I mean, it had different wings, there were different arguments within it, so you don't want to oversimplify, but it had an air of not being so much a, particularly a civil rights movement as more of a nationalist or a separatist movement seeking sort of land rights, sovereignty, and it had that nationalist sort of paramilitary-like air. And that is what Erdrich, um, at least in this novel, and writing from Rosen's point of view, seems to take a slightly skeptical view of this movement, that it was this masculinist and quite sexist movement. And, and if we do see it in parallel to the black 
power movement we discussed in reference to Amiri Baraka. Maybe we can see some similarities there. Though also I would urge you to investigate these movements for yourself. No one writer is going to be able to tell the whole truth about them. Uh, and then symbolically, the, the chapter title is given its name by Richard's yellow pickup truck, which is repossessed, which kind of symbolizes his entire kind of defeat in the novel. Then we move on to a chapter. So we had an earlier chapter called the Ojibwe Week, and now we have a chapter called the Ojibwe Holidays, which is mainly about a Thanksgiving celebration that happens in Rosen's family. So Rosen, her children, Callie and Deanna, the grandparents and great great aunt, Newton and Gizis, Cecile, her cousin, who we really start to learn more about in this chapter, Frank and others celebrate Thanksgiving Day with a large meal. Um, the main things that happen in this chapter is, you know, we're still tracking uh, Rosen and Frank's developing relationship that not everybody is fully aware of. We meet Cecile. We learn more about her. She's a very interesting, though she ends up being a very minor character in this book, but she is an interesting character. She's a martial artist. She wants to become a drug counselor. She's a kind of vivacious and vibrant character, so she's described. And then the other thing that happens in this chapter is a long kind of comical story about Newton's visit to a gynecologist that um, the, the, the punchline essentially is that she, in preparing for the visit, ended up uh, spraying herself with glitter that the children had used for Halloween unknowingly. And this kind of startles the gynecologist who makes a... Uh, a remark that she, who because she doesn't know exactly what's happened, thinks is crude. So there's a couple of different, particularly in the second half of the novel, a couple of moments like this, long kind of dirty jokes. Uh, the dog tells a long dirty joke at one point. We get another big comic set up uh, later in the book. And I think that has to do with, we've talked about uh, this novel's politics of gender, its politics of race and nation, and we'll talk more about that today. But I don't think we want to lose the dimension of class. Uh, Erdrich's characters are working class, they're lower middle class, they're not of the upper bourgeois class. And so I think for Erdrich, I think one of the her investments in this kind of body, B-A-W-D-Y, this kind of... Um, almost crass or crude sexual humor that is a big part of her, her work, not only in this book, is I think a, a kind of resistance against that idea of bourgeois propriety, okay? So she's she's asserting a, uh, a kind of a lower class sensibility that is more honest, that is more clear-eyed, that is more disenchanted about the realities of sex and of the body than a kind of um, upper middle class sense of decorum and propriety would be. So that is chapter 12. Now we move to a chapter simply titled Rosen, which deals with more of her travails, particularly as a mother. So in this chapter, she's worried she'll be fired because she's been late for work a couple of times due to her affair with Frank. So she asks sweetheart Calico to watch Callie and Deanna because Callie and Deanna are at this point in the novel upset. Their parents are getting a divorce, it looks like. Her father's run away. Her mother is having this relationship with a man they don't know very well. So they're very upset. So she asks Sweetheart Calico to watch the children. And that goes badly because Sweetheart Calico and her dog head downtown into Minneapolis. And the children follow her and they get lost in the city. Even though they're protected by the dog, they still sort of spend this day lost in the city. The dog ends up helping them return home, and the chapter ends in this very lyrical passage that we'll look at later, where Rosen thanks the spirits as manifested in nature for protecting her children and returning her children to her. Then we have return to the... Um, sorry, we return to the dog, almost soup. So the dog, almost soup, who is the narrator of the novel, explains more about his background to us. He explains that he's descended from the dog Sorrow that was breastfed by Blue Prairie Woman after the disappearance of her child, who became Matilda, who became the descendant, who became the, no, the ancestor of Sweetheart Calico when she ran away with the antelopes. 
Anyway, I'm digressing. It's a complicated book. He, the dog narrator, explains that he has always been kind of accompanying the Roy Shawano clan. Because remember, this novel is the saga of this one family. Everybody in this novel is essentially related through this family. And so it is the story of this family's history. And even the lovers and partners who, you know, in the novel are cousins. So it's really one family saga. And he explains that he came to Rosen's family to protect them from the chaos that would be created by the presence of the antelope woman. Uh, by, of Sweetheart Calico. And this returns us to this ethical ambiguity around her character that the novel creates. I mentioned that, you know, the potential of readers to sort of be uh, troubled or offended by the way that the novel portrays Klaus as kidnapping this woman, but then what develops from the kidnapping is a kind of relationship that the other characters seem to think is ambiguous, but that they also accept. And she is portrayed as a victim on the one hand of his predation, his male predation, but on the other hand, she is this supernatural agent of chaos, both where she came from and where she is. And so the novel, in exploring this contradiction, between a mythical and a magical worldview and a realistic worldview, and it portrays both. They sort of sit side by side in the book, runs into this very complicated ethical territory about gender and gender relations. And we have to watch to see how that gets resolved or doesn't as we keep exploring the book. Because I think that Erdrich is on the one hand has very much a kind of feminist interest in the way in which this woman has become the victim of this man's behavior and on the other hand she is writing this story about magic and myth in which this woman is a supernatural agent of enchantment and chaos and so um it's it's complicated as it's portrayed in the book i mean your your reaction doesn't have to be complicated you can you can decide ethically yourself but I think the book's portrayal is genuinely ambiguous, at least for most of its length. We'll have to see how it works out in the end. And then in this chapter, you know, one of the features of this dog narrator is that he gives us history from below. And in giving us history from below, he tells us about what the people in history who are, you know, the figures in history who are kind of trampled by the powerful, what they have to do to survive. So he tells us, all about the rules of dog survival, including how to avoid being sacrificed in Ojibwe ceremonies, and also how to avoid being neutered. And what I think is interesting about that is that this book is not simply promoting tradition, Ojibwe tradition over modernity. It points to a lot of features of Native American traditions broadly and Ojibwe traditions narrowly, that you might call into question. And the dog certainly doesn't like this sacrifice aspect, but he also doesn't like the modern thing, which is animals being neutered and kept as pets. So I think, I really think we don't want to un underestimate the complexity of Louise Erdrich's worldview. Remember, she tells us in the beginning of the book that the world is this beaded, beaded construct that's made of light and dark. And you have to attend to all of that light and all of that darkness. And you can't, there's no point in this book, I think, where we can just rest with an Ojibwe perspective, uh, a Western modern perspective, a traditionalist perspective, a feminist perspective. All perspectives in this book ultimately get unsettled by some complexity. All right, moving on. We have a chapter called Lazy Stitch, which the title, as I put in a note there, refers to a particular technique in Plains Indian beadwork, which is what Rosen and her family uh, do. Rosen takes the twins to their grandmother's rural home, and there they are doing beadwork, just like the mythical twins in the kind of frame story that open each of the main four divisions of the book. And the children become deathly ill and they almost die of this illness. And Almost Soup, the dog, reveals to the reader that he has taken the girl's souls into himself to protect them in their illness. And so that is the main event of this chapter. Then we move on to part three, and 
we get some background because it's at this point that Rosen begins to worry that why do all these bad things keep happening to her children? Why do they get lost in the city? Why do they get deathly ill? And we learn in this chapter that the twins' umbilical cords were mixed up in the hospital when they were born, which Newton worries will badly affect their lives, because for her it's part of her spiritual practice that she'll keep each child's umbilical cord and that that will be a kind of a guide for them in their lives. But when the umbilical cords get mixed up, this might have bad effects. So this leads Gizus and Newton to say, well, we need to spiritually rectify this problem with the children by giving them Ojibwe names. If we give them names that connect them to tradition, to the tribe, to the ancestors, this will protect them, and this will prevent some of these problems. Now, Rosen resists this. Rosen is a very, you know, she's a modern woman, and she does some... Ojibwe practices, but on the other hand, she thinks, she seems to think that some of it is, is not admissible in the modern world, is superstition, and so she's resisting this naming aspect. Though another part of her, I think, fears the spiritual power of this act. So then, in short course, again, something bad happens to the twins. They sneak into Cecile's car and ride with her in the city, so they kind of again get lost in the city where they end up at Frank's bakery. We're told that Sweetheart Calico still secretly lives in, er in Rosen's house in the city, and Cecile and Rosen, once Rosen comes back to the city to get her kids back from Frank, Cecile and she and her argue about the reality of Sweetheart Calico. Is she really this supernatural figure? And about their family's magical history, about all these magical, mystical elements that have happened in the history of the Shawanos and Roy's, starting with Scranton Roy's breastfeeding Matilda, going on through Blue Prairie Woman's marriage to the deer and Matilda's relationships with the antelope uh, and the sort of strange twin relationship of Zosie and Mary. They've sort of heard all these stories and they're arguing about, well, are these stories true? And then also connecting things to the past, Frank reveals that his aspiration as a baker is to recreate the Blitzkuchen, the, that sort of glorious cake, that lightning cake, that the German Klaus, who was kidnapped by Shawano after World War I, made for the Roys. So that also connects us back to an earlier moment of family history in the book. In the next chapter, it's called Nibi, which is the Ojibwe word for water. Klaus and Richard are on the run in the city and they're struggling because they lack food, they lack shelter, they particularly lack water. And Klaus is thirsty and he's afflicted by these supernatural seeming visions of the antelope woman. And this chapter ends with him drinking straight out of the Mississippi despite its pollution. And in the water he sees her kind of shimmering appearance. The next chapter is where Rosen finds a letter from Jimmy Badger, who we met in the chapter in which Klaus first kidnapped Sweetheart Calico. Jimmy Badger writes a letter begging that Sweetheart Calico be returned to her home in Montana because her absence is causing all of this disruption and, dis and destruction. So we understand this idea that she really is this supernatural being and that her presence or absence has these supernatural effects. Sweetheart, meanwhile, is stalking Klaus and Richard through the city because I think it's later going to be revealed that for her, she's been captured by Klaus, so Klaus needs to free her. She can't just go back. He needs to kind of do it of his own accord. Rosen, meanwhile, has lost her job and is sometimes working in Frank's bakery, and then Gizus and Newton come to town. They visit the bakery, and Frank you know, explains to Newton that he is trying to recreate the Blitzkuchen, and she explains to him that the reason it's as good as it was is because the German feared for his life when he was baking it. And so if you can't put that fear into the food, you're not going to be able to recreate the the cake. And Frank, you know, Frank wonders, well, is my fear that I'll lose this woman I love uh, enough? And then finally, a, dis uh, a disheveled, desperate Richard and Klaus enter the bakery looking for water, and Sweetheart walks out with Klaus, because again, she needs him to 
free her. The next chapter returns us to the dog. Sweetheart's dog speaks to Klaus and tells him a long, dirty joke, which I won't repeat to spare your own delicate bourgeois sensibilities. And then Richard, at the end of the chapter, goes to a police station to turn himself in for illegal dumping. And while there, he also receives his divorce papers from Rosen. So just as um, Klaus has to eventually atone for his sins or crimes or however you want to put it of his own free will by freeing Sweetheart, it's the same with Richard. He can't just run, <clears throat> run away from the bad things he's done. And this has been a theme throughout the novel. Scranton Roy goes to massacre the Ojibwe, kills the old woman, and he atones for it, which leads to his son being married into the Shawano clan. And so throughout the book, there's this sense that you, if you've done something wrong, you need of your own free will to kind of confess it and lay it down. And that's what Richard does. We, we sort of reach the end of Richard's story in this chapter. Chapter 20, Frank and Rosen are now living together and Frank's birthday is coming up. Frank doesn't really want to celebrate his birthday party, so he wants to draw attention away from it. So he throws a surprise party for Rosen but she wants to surprise him somehow on his birthday. So she attempts to greet him while naked as a kind of um, erotic surprise. And she ends up, these two things collide, and she ends up greeting the entire surprise party in a state of undress. And so, you know, don't miss the aspect of Erdrich's work that's extremely funny, um, that's very you know, rawly humorous. I think that's an important, I think sometimes when people discuss Louise Erdrich, they only talk about the kind of more mystical elements of her work and that you never hear about as much about the, the fact that she's really into um, this kind of like low comedy. I don't mean low in a judgmental sense. I mean, in, in, in like the sense of, uh, you know, sitcoms, comedy, stage comedy. She's really into that. And, and it's an important thematic aspect of her work, I think because it's about having this, as I said, completely disillusioned view of sex in the body that's able to laugh at these things and not take them so seriously. Then we have a chapter called Northwest Trader Blue. This chapter is in certain ways the climax of the novel. It ties everything together. Gizus and Newton finally name the twins. Gizus names Callie after Rainbow Bridge, who was the old woman killed by Scranton Roy, who came to her to Gizus, that is, in a vision. And Newton names Deanna Blue, Prairie Woman, whose name she acquired from Blue Prairie Woman along with these blue beads she was seeking in a game of chance. And so the lineages begun in the novel with this old woman killed by Scranton Roy and this mother who's bereft of her child in the massacre that Scranton Roy participated in, these names finally find their home in the present. And in that sense, there's been this reparation in the present for the damage done in the past and done not only by their descendants, but by the descendants of Scranton Roy as well. Um, I think that, you know, part of this novel's vision is that it's not that you, um, it's, it, the world is, is made of light and dark. So it's not that you destroy the bad part, it's that you incorporate it into this ongoing reparative process. And then at the end of this chapter, we learn that the beads that Newton acquired from Blue Prairie Woman are now in the possession of Sweetheart Calico, who's been keeping them in her mouth, which explains why she's been silent. And she removes them and gives them to uh, Deanna and speaks her first words in the novel, which is she requests to be freed from Klaus. And this is what's happening in the final chapter. In the final chapter... Klaus resolves to turn his life around, to get sober, and to free Sweetheart. But he he doesn't quite succeed at first. She comes to him, and he ties her to him again. But they walk together out of the city, and finally he does release her. And the novel concludes with this vision of her walking away to that, you know, that horizon, that blue, that other side of the sky that has been a motif throughout the novel, she walks away into that finally free. The symbol of wildness, the antelope woman, is finally freed from what had been this urban cage. So that is the plot of the book, and I want now to think about what it all means. What is it 
that Louise Erdrich is trying to tell us with these themes. So now I want to return to looking at some passages in the novel that lay out what what it is we are we are being told. So we saw this already. The novel is very invested in the idea of narration and storytelling. And it tells us this story in the prose passages that introduce each of the novel's four main divisions. And we learn in the first one that the world is essentially being beaded together by these twins, twin sisters using light and dark. And so we have the motif of twins. We have, as we had in Paula Gunn Allen's poem, Grandmother, we have a female creator. So this is very much in distinction to a Christian worldview where you have this at least implicitly male creator. Here we have female creators of the world making this this art that is the world out of threads of light and darkness. And they're each trying to outdo each other and upset the balance of the world. So this imagery of twins as creative and destructive forces recurs throughout the book in its many twin characters. Um, and it's important to tell stories because as the narrator that we don't yet know is a dog tells us on the novel's first page, I relate this story here in order that it not be lost. It's important to tell stories to preserve the past, to preserve tradition. And similarly, we have this model of beadwork as the model of the novel's narration. No visible beginning or end to the design. Impossible to find, impossible, impossible is not a word, impossible to find the starting knot, the final tie. So just as Louise Erdrich's storytelling style is very non-linear, it goes on and on. There's, it's very hard to say who the main character is, what the main plot is. It's just this ever renewing storytelling sort of device that just constantly renews itself just as the beadwork constantly goes on and on with no visible beginning or end now in parts three and four we hear more about this um sort of female artistry as the creation of the world so we get a little parable here sounding feather great grandma of the first shawano so you note we thought the story began with scranton roy but we get little hints of what went before that. So one of the things that went before that was Blue Prairie Woman's Deer Marriage. Now we hear about the story of, of the great-grandmother of the Shawanos. So there's no visible beginning or end to this story. It goes on and on. It started anywhere. It ends anywhere. So we get this parable. Sounding feather, great-grandma of the first Shawano dyed her quills blue and green in a mixture of her own piss boiled with shavings of copper. No dye came out the same way twice. According to her contribution, always different. The final color resulted from what she ate, drank, what she did for sex, and what she said to her mother or child the day before. So what is the material out of which the female artists who author the world create their work? they create it out of themselves, out of their own experiences, and out of their own bodies. So for this book, the female body is kind of the source of all reality. That's what this book tells us. And I think that accords very well with what I was talking about as the literature of the multicultural period's questioning of Western myths, which tend to be much more male-oriented and much more idealistic, that is, the world is created by ideas and this says no the world is created by bodies it's created by female bodies and even though she had a bad day the passage ends by telling us that the blue she made was innocent so um that's part of the novel's motif of rejecting binaries of good and evil that you know good can come from bad bad can come from good the world is made of all of these things and if you harbor an ideology that says you can eliminate the bad, well, then you're just mimicking that ideology of progress that tried to eliminate indigenous cultures in the Americas. You, if you adopt this binary worldview, the end result, I think, you know, ultimately is, um, is an ideology of elimination, of genocide for Erdrich. That's Erdrich's claim. And, but also, though it's innocent, you know, what results... It's there. There are also issues there. She doesn't she doesn't have a simplistically good worldview, just as she doesn't have a simplistically 
you know, celebratory uh, of the bad worldview. In the fourth story, we hear about how um, we hear about uh, we just get she. She won enough for the beads. She gets these white heart beads, which is, you know, the source of Richard's name. All she could think of was finishing her work. She reached for the knife, frightened the children ran. She had to follow them then, searching out their panic trail, calling for them in the dark places and the bright places, the indigo, the white, the unfinished details, and the larger meaning of her design. So this book is also about motherhood. It's about maternity, from the difficulties of Blue Prairie Woman and Joji and Mary to the difficulties Rosen experiences. This is a book about how it's hard to balance motherhood with other commitments, particularly in Rosen's story, and how the obligations of maternity and the obligations of being the artist whose beadwork is the world come into conflict. And so that's what I mean when I say that it's not a simplistic worldview. It's not just a, you know, uh, uh, just a cheering on of, um, of what in the 90s was called girl power. Uh, it's more complicated than that because it says that that is going to come at a cost. It's, it says that that's not an easy uh, thing for a woman to do, to take on this responsibility of holding up the world while raising her children. And so in that sense, um, the obligations of maternity and the obligations of making the world uh, have this conflict, but they also work together because when the woman makes the world and then her children run in fear, she has to search through her design to learn its meaning. So that's what we're being told there. We talked about the worldview, at least a little bit, about the worldview that I see Erdra critiquing uh, as a part of her story. And that comes to the fore when she talks about the Dawes Act, the turning of tribal held land into private property and how this turning of tribal land into private property supports an ideology of American capitalism, of people mainly concerned for money, and it leads Native Americans to become complicit in their own oppression by doing things for money and for economic success and thus neglecting their traditions, their culture, their people, and being complicit in the very Western ideologies of private property that have dispossessed them. This also goes along with this idea of progress that Erdrich critiques. She is not a progressive. She thinks the idea of progress is a very dangerous idea. Why? Because the idea of progress was the idea by which European colonists and then American white settlers used to legitimate their dispossession of Native Americans. They said, we Europeans, European descended people, we believe in reason, we believe in capitalism, we believe in all these ideas that are at the vanguard of the modern, and so we're going to sweep across this continent and eliminate everything that isn't that. So there's a scene where Augustus Roy, I think it's when he's going to see his uh, boys off to the war, is in a train station and he sees that the walls are decorated with these kind of historical illustrations. The walls were paneled with ancient oak worked into scenes of progress. There were, wag there were wagons, valiant pioneers, oxen, plows, trains, of course. As the Americans advanced counterclockwise around the great waiting room, Indians melted away before them, looking sadly back over their shoulders or turning their backs entirely as if to walk straight into the wood. Okay, so progress is the ideology that has dispossessed Native Americans because it has this linear idea of development that treats everything that it can't assimilate into itself as merely backward. And so progress and elimination go hand in hand. Erdrich critiques progress. And she critiques, too, the government as something that trying to help Native Americans, trying to be progressive, ends up just extirpating their traditions further. Um, there was a new government policy designed in the kindest way to make things worse. It was called relocation and helped Indians move to cities all over the country. So there's this forced or at least um, unofficially coerced 
turning of Indian lands into private property, educating children in Indian children in European modeled boarding schools, and then relocation to urbanize Native Americans. And all these things are meant to be progressive. They're meant to help Native Americans, and even some progressive Native American leaders, as Erdrich portrays, went along with it. But it just ended up, uh, it just ended up deracinating that culture, disarticulating that culture, and as Erdrich says here, making things worse. And it goes even deeper than this, because it's not just about political policy. Because that, that would be, at least in theory, easy enough to change. It's also about worldviews. And for Erdrich, the problem really starts with the Western capitalist modern view of time. The idea that time is linear, it only moves in one direction. That goes hand in hand with the idea of progress. You have to get on you know, what politicians today call the right side of history. And if you're not on the right side of history, you're just eliminated. And again, that sounds progressive. It's progressives today who talk that way. But for Erdrich, it's a dangerous way to talk from the point of view from which she's writing, which is of a group of people that were victimized precisely on the basis of that view of linear time marching endlessly forward. And also the idea that time should be profitably and efficiently divided up into separate parcels. Uh, that divides time, it divides culture, it divides nature from humanity, it divides spirituality from humanity. And she addresses this in her chapter, The Ojibwe Week, where she talks about the names that Ojibwe's gave the days of the week and um, how that was brought about. The names they gave them were brought about by their meeting the settlers and adopting this European view of time. So she says that the Ojibwe word for Saturday means floor washing day, which tells you that nobody cared what day of the week it was until the Ojibwe had floors, and also that the Ojibwe washed their floors. So the division of time into days is part of this idea of being modern and having you know, different days for different activities. It's part of this general worldview, just as dividing the lands into private property creates atomization, individualism. So dividing time into days and days into parcels of time devoted to doing certain activities efficiently, that just ruins the kind of organic, holistic way that, there, that Erdrich saw the culture working before. Although the Ojibwe never had a special day to pray until mission and boarding schools taught you how you could slack off the rest of the week, Sunday now has its name, Praying Day. So again, Ojibwe spirituality was holistic. You didn't pray in a particular place at a particular time. Your sort of spirituality was part of your general relation to nature, but then you have this mentality, which you will call you know, a colonial mentality, where Sunday is the day to pray and the rest of the week is not for spiritual things. It's for material things like washing the floor, or going to work. And by setting spirituality apart from labor and setting different times apart to do these different things, the, this Western mentality ruins a more holistic vision. First work day, proving that the names of the days of the weeks are the products of colonized minds because I think the idea is you'd have to have a colonized mind to adopt this Western capitalist perspective that you want to work all week, uh, that, that that is itself a colonial capitalist mentality. Now, on the other hand, Erdrich has a discourse on gender and sex throughout the novel that I think complicates some of what we've been saying a little bit. So. On the one hand, she portrays Ojibwe tradition as being very nuanced and complicated with respect to gender and sexuality. So in the chapter where Blue Prairie Woman needs a new name, they bring her to the, the namer. And the namer is portrayed as, uh, this namer was nameless and was neither a man nor a woman and so took power from the in-between. 
So just as the Ojibwe don't necessarily separate, and this is, again, I'm not making anthropological claims. I'm not qualified to do so. What I'm trying to do is see what Erdrich thinks of Ojibwe tradition. So just to explain the point of view I'm coming from. So as Erdrich portrays it, the Ojibwe also have a holistic, nuanced, and comprehensive view of gender, that it's possible for there to be a fluidity of gender, that it's possible to take power from being in between genders, and that I think she thinks is a good thing, just as it's a good thing to not have separate days of the week for different activities, but to have a perspective that embraces a greater complexity. The world is made of dark and light. But this also, as I mentioned in my plot summary, kind of runs aground on contemporary visions of, of things like the relation between men and women. So Klaus is portrayed as not understanding his own action with respect to Sweetheart Calico. There had been no clue, no lead, no sighting of the woman he kidnapped. No, she went willingly, didn't she? It's all unclear. And it's unclear throughout the novel how much agency people have because we hear of love as being motivated by being possessed by the Wendigo, this appetitive, desiring spirit. And Klaus, at the end of the book, attributes his actions towards Sweetheart Calico to the Wendigo. And Sweetheart Calico herself is not an unambiguous figure. I mean, there's scenes where she endangers the children. And so what really is going on there? Um, do individuals have agency? Should we just judge Klaus a kidnapper, a kind of rapist? And that's how Rosen sees it. Rosen says that um, he should get 10 to 20 years in Stillwater Pen. That is, he should go to jail for what he's done. And the end of the book says that he does need to atone, that he does need to free Sweetheart Calico. But I get the point I'm trying to make is the question of individual moral agency that says, you know, one person's act was absolutely wrong seems to depend on some of the individualism and a refusal of spiritual causes that Erdrich is elsewhere in the book at pains to reject. And that, I think, leads to this conflict between worldviews in which there might be something to say for the more individualist worldview because it asks that individuals like Klaus take responsibility for their individual acts of predation. And so this also comes up when Rosen thinks about her background in the American Indian movement. She says, um, or she thinks, she says, AIM, the American Indian movement, was complicated for women because, for instance, if you had your period, you couldn't be around any of the good-looking men and couldn't cook or touch their pipes or any sacred objects but had to stay in a moon lodge, which... And then I think the, the kind of punchline to that passage on the next page was like, which was in, in, a, in a friend's apartment. So the American Indian movement tried to revive a bunch of what they saw or they understood to be Native American spiritual practices, some of which were rather on the patriarchal side, particularly the sort of segregation of women during their menstrual period. And so from Rosen's perspective here and from Rosen's perspective in the passage I just read, a kind of progressive feminist view is actually superior to these kind of revived Native American traditions, which bring along with them this baggage of a segregation of the genders, of it's being hard to judge the, the ethics of Klaus's act from one point of view, whereas from her point of view, it's just kidnapping and rape. So, uh, and yet on the other hand, Erdrich portrays the power of the in-between, this nuanced view of gender and sexuality. And I think this all ties into what this book is about at heart, which is about the contradictions and complexity of trying to live in a modern urban world as a Native American and trying to take from different aspects of that complicated cultural heritage what's good and discard what's bad. And that will come up in some later passages that I want to look at. There are portrayals of cultural fusion in the book. This book is not one that says, uh, for reasons we saw on the last page, that all Native American traditions are good, and it's concomitantly not a book that says all Western traditions are bad. 
I think the Western traditions it wants to discard are those that lend themselves to capitalism, progressivism, genocide, imperialism. But it also sees kind of potential in other Western traditions. So, for instance, Christianity is a part of the background of the book. The twin Joji and Mary were named for the good blue robed woman and Josephette were named Mary for the good blue robed woman and Josephette for the good husband. Only the Ojibwe tongue made Joji of the latter name. So Christianity gets kind of incorporated. This is Mary and Joseph into Ojibwe tradition. Ojibwe tradition is able to be syncretist with regard to parts of Western tradition that aren't simply a threat to it, such as that ideology of linear time capitalist individualism. Similarly, Erdrich is very fond, not only in this book, but in other books, of citing Greek and Roman authors, um, because I think she sees, it's implied in the passage on the right, that what happened to pagan, what were called pagan traditions when Christianity conquered Europe was very similar to what happened to Native American life when when Europeans conquered America. That there were a bunch of traditions that were had a very holistic view of nature and gender and storytelling that were taken over by Christianity, which with having one male god and having a linear view of history as progressing toward revelation sort of inaugurates what will become capitalism. So Erdrich's very fond of Greek and Roman authors and pagan European traditions. So again, in the chapter on the Ojibwe week, she says, um, the Ojibwe words for all of these lovely animals and plants are original and fluid words, but in all probability, some lackluster, hard-ass mis missionary Jesuit, like maybe Bishop Baraga, the famous snowshoe priest, put those names down in his Ojibwe dictionary in the hope of making the Ojibwe people into hard-ass, lackluster people like him by forcing them to live every day of their lives working or praying or halfway to nowhere. Many days of the week in English go back to various ancient pagan gods, Thor's day, Frigga's day, Saturn's day, etc. So her point is here in this passage is that the Ojibwe names for the days of the week are actually worse than the English names because they're the product of this colonial mentality where there's a latent anti-colonialism in the English names because they go back to uh, tribal European pre-Christian pre-colonial languages and worldviews. So you see, it's very complicated. She's, she's, she's sort of looking for what good parts of the Ojibwe tradition have in, part, have in common with the good parts of the European tradition. And she also has an eye for the way in which the Ojibwe collaborate with an oppressive mindset. And then finally, there's the passage where, you know, Augustus Roy is constantly reading the Greek, the ancient Greek epic, the Iliad. And Joji defends the Iliad when he throws it into the fire, I think, because he thinks it inspired his sons to be warlike. She says, we're just like those people, never knowing what the gods or the government is going to do to us next. So she sees, you know, in ancient Greek literature, just as Erdrich sees in, in, you know, the Nordic background of the English days of the week, this similarity to the parts of Ojibwe culture that are worth celebrating. There's also an importance of nature in the novel, that nature and humanity are on a continuum and they can't be separated from each other. You can't just, as the Christian tradition does when it makes um, humanity the steward of nature, you can't set humanity over nature. And this comes out in the passage on the Blitzkuchen when they decide not to harm or kill the German Klaus when he bakes them this cake because the cake shows them the kind of spiritual connection among all life. How in sharing this sweet intensity of life deny its substance in even their enemies. So violence toward one's enemies isn't a solution because all humanity shares in the same spark of life. This is also shared among animals. Now that's at the macro level demonstrated in this novel by the fact that our viewpoint character and our narrator is an animal, is a dog. But it's also shown 
in the story of the deer marriage of blue prairie woman's marriage to the deer how does that marriage begin a deer comes and she's about to kill him for for food but she finally advanced toward the deer and looked him in the eye and she felt ashamed she knew hunger when she saw it so humans and animals feel the same things they're moved by the same needs and so you can't set humanity over nature which is why it's portrayed in this novel as perfectly fine for humans to mate with animals for humans whether it's in one of the dirty jokes told by the calico sweetheart's dog or whether it's in the story of matilda and the antelope or of blue prairie woman and the deer humans and animals are on the same plane and animals can also be the protectors of humans and we see that in the passage where sweetheart calico's dog rescues the children and rosen who's generally a very modern woman who's scornful of certain traditionalist ojibwe ideas she understands that when her children are returned to her um rosen knows that they gizus and newton have been smoking their little pipes and praying all night long they learned the words to their prayers from their grandmother peace and their grandfather wabizi the swan during the years those two raised them the words call the spirits by name from each direction from the sky from the earth from the night from the day from the sun from the moon from the winds the flocks of birds and the solitary birds from the clans from the animals that give themselves as food or are sent to delight us or to help us like the dog from the rivers from the lakes from the rain from the water in the mother's body and the water in the snow from the stars in the mysterious place the stars came from and the fire the original fire so all of nature can be petitioned can be helpful and again note i mean when the dog narrates the dog isn't that into this idea of animals giving themselves as food so just as erdrick has her female characters question some of the gender ideology of native american tradition so she has her animal characters question some of the ideology of nature in the native american tradition it's not a simplistic celebration but on balance the holistic worldview toward seeing everything as part of nature and working together is one i think the novel ultimately endorses even if it has some questions around the edges of this worldview and the questions are not shied away from i think that's what makes this a powerful book and this brings me i think to my final slide where i want to talk about some of the ways that the novel negotiates tradition versus modernity which it tends to represent as a question of setting a city versus the land versus the countryside so on the i want to sort of do this slide in reverse on the passages on the right we hear how important it is for the twins callie and deanna to have ojibwe names that if you cut yourself off totally from tradition you're not going to do very well and that's why gizus and newton insist to rosen that the girls need traditional names and the novel seems to endorse this worldview. It seems to say that no matter what some of the benefits or even just the inevitabilities of the modern, of the urban, of the capitalist are, they still need to be resisted and corrected by being in touch with tradition. Because if you cut yourself off from tradition, you cut yourself off from nature, you cut yourself off from the land, and that comes out in the, the remarkable passage that ends one of the chapters where um, the narrator says, uh, Gakabikang, that's the name our old ones call the city. Place of the Falls is what it means from way back when it started as a trading village. Although driveways and houses, concrete parking garages and business stores cover the cityscape, the, that same land is hunched underneath. There are times like now Frank gets a sense of the temporary. It could all blow off, and yet the sheer land would be left underneath. Sand, rock, the Indian black seashell-bearing earth. Because modernity, technology, capitalism, the linear sense of time, these aren't 
100% bad, but they are 100% temporary. And what will be left when they are gone is the land from which it all came in the first place. And so if you cut off your relationship to the land and to the traditions that know how to be in relation with the land, you will be completely adrift. And that is what I think Rosen has to learn over the course of the novel, especially insofar as she's the main character of its second half. That's her kind of arc as a character. She has to learn that. And the novel isn't asking her to give up the part of modernity that it portrays as um, not entirely bad, particularly that feminist consciousness. But it does ask that she remain in touch with the land. And she talks this out with Cecile in a passage that I want to end with, a, a passage on page 216 that I think really gets to what Erdrich is trying to do in this book. So Cecile and Rosen are talking about their magical family heritage. And Rosen says, I remember these stories vaguely. But haven't you ever asked yourself, says Cecile, how this all affects us? Haven't you ever wondered how history is working on us? Don't you sometimes pause in the midst of things? Yes, says Rosen, I do pause in the midst of things. And wonder? Yes, I wonder. Think about it, says Cecile. We developed as a people over many thousands of years, our culture, our ways, our adaptations. Then all of a sudden in one generation, wham, warp speed acculturation, and now we're the products of two cultures. Something happened in our family that cannot be explained by the culture we live in now. So what Erdrich wants to do is to write a contemporary novel that takes full account of contemporary life, um, including it's not bad parts, uh, it's, you know, the ple some of the pleasures of urban life, some of the true parts of a modern ideology. We mentioned the, the feminism as perhaps the novel's key example here. But it wants to make sure that in doing that, it finds a place within that present day real world for the truths of a culture that that modernity has been displaced. And there we can end with the with the I think what I began with as the 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 secret the message of magical realism which is yes embrace the contemporary reality but find in your embrace of the contemporary reality room for the worldview that cannot be explained by realism that the Ojibwe ancestors had make room in that realism for the true magic that has been eliminated by the march of the thing that calls itself progress. And so be able to have a novel that has both the culture we live in now and the things that it can't quite explain. And that, I think, is where I want to leave us in our conversation about Louise Erdrich's Antelope Woman. So... It's a complicated book. It's uh, in many ways a strange book, but I hope my, my uh, explanation makes some sense and maybe you can make some more sense of it if you want to write a paper on it. And there I'll leave you. Thank you very much for your time and have a great day.